Hello, everyone. My name is Kathy Nickham, and I'm the Education Director for the DPC Education Center. And I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to our webinar on the COVID explosion lessons learned from New York. I'd like to thank the American Society of Nephrology and each of our speakers for sharing this time with us today. We know their time is very valuable. And I also thank all of you for participating, knowing also that your time is extremely important. In order to have ample time for your written questions at the end, I will keep uh, my introductions and my remarks brief. Your lines are muted and will stay muted throughout the program. And you can submit your questions through the chat box at the end of the program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available along with the slides on our website within the next week. We also ask that you complete the feedback form at the end of the program. Our first speaker is Dr. Alan Feiger, a clinical professor at the Yale School of Medicine and the co-chair of the ASN COVID-19 response team. Alan? Hi, everybody. Um, first, let me thank you for inviting uh, us to speak. Um, and I want to start by saying there's a lot of really good information and also a lot of rumor and misinformation that's out there regarding COVID-19 uh, and particularly uh, its effect on chronic kidney disease patients, on dialysis patients, and, the, uh, and on their families. And so really what we want to do is go through some, first I would like to go through some um, questions I've been asked and some information. And then after I speak, two uh, nephrologists in New York will uh, talk about their experience and their hands-on uh, real-life um, uh, words about uh, this infection. So I want to start by talking a little bit about COVID-19. Many of you may have heard Dr. Redfield, who is the head of the uh, CDC, speak about this. And what's known now about COVID-19 is that it's probably two or three times as infectious as influenza, as common flu. That 25%, one out of every four patients who gets infected may have no symptoms at all. And more than half of patients or people who get infected have no symptoms or very mild symptoms. So that's an interesting fact that probably half or so of people who have been infected have either had no symptoms or mild symptoms, so they wouldn't even know that they've had the infection. Dr. Redfield also uh, stressed something that we've only really learned in the last uh, week or two weeks of experience, which is that patients who have the infection but don't have any symptoms at all yet may be having virus that spreads by their mouth and by their nose so that everyone knows you can get uh, infected if you're near someone who sneezes or coughs and has that infection. But we now know that people who are not sneezing and coughing but are infected probably are shedding virus as they speak, probably have it on their clothing, on their hands. And so um, the increased vigilance that now is part of what we're all doing in this country is in part necessary because we now know that there are many, many people walking around who don't even know they have this illness who nonetheless may be able to spread the infection. We also know that there are places where very early case finding and then contacting people who had the disease, who were who who in touch with people who were in, infected, really is critical to stop infections. An example of that really is in Germany. Germany took a very aggressive stance in using test kits to identify people with symptoms and contacts of people with symptoms, and identified many people with infection but in identifying them and in a very early phase, um, isolating them, keeping them away from other people. The number of patients entering the hospital and those with complications in Germany is much less than in other 
uh, European countries. And finally, what Dr. Redfield commented about, which is critically important, is that, as we all now know, all now know social is the most powerful method we have to mitigate this outbreak. That is, if we're all staying at least six feet away from one another, since some of us may be infected and not even know it, that that social distancing really does powerfully affect uh, decreasing communication of the infection. So, so how do people catch this infection? Well, evidence would suggest that probably the most common way of getting this infection is that you touch a person or a surface that has virus on it and then touch your face. The virus then gets into your mouth or your nose or actually into your eyes and infects you. So it doesn't have to be somebody breathes on you or sneezes near you or coughs on you. But probably most common, someone who has the infection uh, either coughs or sneezes or even talks, and the virus comes from them and lands on surfaces around them. And then we inadvertently, without knowing it, touch those surfaces and then touch our, our faces, and that's the way we get infected. Of course, somebody infected with the virus does cough or sneeze or even breathe on you or near you, and the virus can get in directly. The reason it's important to understand that touching surfaces and then your face is such a critical part of this is that so many of the measures that we've recommended, including particularly washing your hands whenever you've been in contact with anything outside of your house, when you've touched surfaces outside of your house, when you've been in contact with people outside of your house, washing your hands so that the virus, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's really a, a, a puny virus. It's easily killed by hand washing. It's easily killed by normal um, uh, household products that uh, you use to clean surfaces. Um, we know that doing those things, hand washing and cleaning surfaces, is a major reason to um, uh, stop the virus spread. We also know that dialysis patients are particularly at higher risk for uh, problems with this infection. The last bullet on this slide is the first reason. The first reason that dialysis patients are at higher risk is that dialysis patients all come into centers, can't stay at home like uh, every, everyone has been advised to do, but have to three times a week come into hemodialysis centers. Uh, have to be in transportation uh, to get to and get from hemodialysis centers. So the risk of contacting people or surfaces that are potentially infected is obviously higher in hemodialysis patients. Also, the upper two bullets is that if a patient with dialysis does get infected, the risk of complications is higher than the risk for people who are not on dialysis. And in part, it's probably because patients on dialysis in general are older, have a higher number of us on blood pressure medicines for high blood pressure, diabetes management, or people with chronic lung disease. And so um, we have to be particularly careful about uh, avoiding infection uh, in, uh, in this group of us with dialysis. And so what are some of the facilities doing to try to stop the infection from coming into our dialysis unit? Well, as I know you all know by now, um, virtually all dialysis units are screening all patients every day, are asking patients to call ahead if you have a temperature more than 100 or a new cough or a sore throat, and that most dialysis units are now screening everybody, staff, patients, anybody who comes in through the entryway to see if they have fever or any symptoms. The second is that dialysis units are now isolating patients who have symptoms suggesting this disease so that many now have a separate shift or even a separate facility for uh, patients who have symptoms or those who have been tested and shown to have COVID-19. In some places where there's not a separate shift or a separate facility that's available, 
what the CDC has recommended is a separate room in the facility with the door closed, if that's possible, for treating patients with this infection. And finally, if that's not available, the CDC has suggested a separate area of the dialysis unit with at least six feet of separation in all directions from any other patients. Um, patients with symptoms of this disease um, do get, should be getting tested to see if indeed they have the disease. And obviously, any patients who get ill and who have more trouble breathing or other reasons to be in the hospital should be getting their care in the hospital. Now let me say a few words about all this the stuff that you've seen of gowns and gloves and masks and um, uh, goggles or face shields. The first is that the people who ought to be wearing masks are, number one, all patients with cough, fever, sore throats, all of them, or any who think they might have had those symptoms, are given masks when they enter the dialysis unit. The second, of course, is that all staff caring for patients in order to prevent spreading it or getting it themselves are wearing face masks, gowns, and eye protection. In many dialysis units around the country now, all people coming into the dialysis unit, whoever they are, are asked to wear masks. And it's important to mention something about the masks for people who have no symptoms at all. The major reason for those masks is just in case any of us are in that early part of disease where we have no symptoms, those masks prevent us from spreading the infection to others. The protection that you get from a mask if you have no symptoms and you don't have the disease, the protection has probably more to do with preventing you from touching your mouth or your nose or your, your eyes than it does preventing the germs from getting in through the air into your mouth. Because dialysis facilities require that many people are close together, most facilities are now requiring, therefore, that all of us wear masks so that we can protect one another. And so, as I just said, I want to emphasize this because I think it's important to understand what face masks do is, number one, help spread infection from people with symptoms or before they have symptoms who may have that virus. For people near sick patients and for staff, it's used in order to prevent the spread from one person to another and to prevent that virus from going uh, to the people who are caring for uh, patients. You've heard a lot on the news about these things called N95 masks. The N95 is just the kind of mask that in testing has shown itself to prevent about 95% of all germs from going through the fabric. It's a mask which has been very, uh, very uh, effective in preventing infection spread, but they need to be individually fitted, and fit testing is done at hospitals to assure that these N95 masks are good. Surgical masks are, it's been shown by the CDC, to be just as effective or just about as effective as these N95 masks as long as there aren't big gaps uh, between the mask and the nose, for example, or under the chin, so that the masks have to be fitted in a way that they cling pretty closely to uh, all parts of the face when they're put on. Several patients have asked me, can I catch coronavirus from my dialysis machine, since that machine is used from other people? We know that the viruses on all surfaces, including on the surface of the dialysis machine, are easily killed with routine cleansers. And before you're put onto a machine, as I think you know, and this has been true for so many years, a technician thoroughly wipes all surfaces of your machine, your chair, your table, and anything the nurses or technicians use, blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes, with a cleaning agent that kills the virus. And the virus, as far as we've ever seen, does not travel through the blood and from the blood into the dialysis machine. 
There have been no cases that have been known of that type of spread. So the answer is you really cannot catch it as long as they're being properly uh, wiped down by the technician. And then finally, how do you protect yourself? Well, as you've heard so many times in so many places, the best way is by social distancing, avoiding contact with people who are infected, or these days with most people since you don't know for sure who's infected. And most important, uh, avoiding transferring virus from your hands to your face. Now, I've seen people who come into uh, the shopping uh, centers or come into a, a, a grocery store that are wearing masks and are wearing gloves, often the rubber gloves that are used, you know, at the sink. And they think that that's protecting them. And what I've seen as I've watched that is people in those rubber gloves then adjusting their mask with a rubber glove, touching their face with a rubber glove. Obviously, if you have a rubber glove on, virus doesn't go through to your fingers. But virus does stay on the fingers of the glove. And if the glove is being used to do all those other things, then in fact, gloves are useless in that circumstance. My strong advice is that you shouldn't be thinking that gloves protect you in walking around or doing things. Rather, you should be thinking that washing your hands is a far more effective way of preventing virus from coming to where you need to be. Finally, I want to say during a pandemic, you have to presume that everyone you meet has the infection. And so um, as we get through these next several weeks, I hope it's not longer than that, of having this virus spread around the country, those are the things I think that are most important. Okay, so let me now turn this over to Dr. Michelle McCricky. Uh, Michelle is a professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the Montefiore Medical Center and Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York. Michelle. Thank you, Alan. So I'll be reviewing what dialysis facilities and staff are doing to protect our patients during this COVID-19 pandemic, and I'll give you a little bit of our own experience in New York. So I'd like to think about targeting multiple areas of the dialysis facility in terms of reducing spread, and I apologize if some of this reiterates what Dr. Kleiger has already uh, mentioned. Uh, so think about protecting yourself before your arrival, what you can do upon arrival to the unit, what, what is being done in the waiting room area, in the treatment area where you're receiving your dialysis, and what is being done for staff training to protect our patients. So again, as Alan mentioned, call ahead before you arrive to dialysis if you, if you think you've been exposed to COVID-19 or if you have flu-like symptoms such as fever, cough, difficulty breathing, muscle aches, worsening fatigue, loss of appetite, so that the dialysis staff can plan for your arrival and take steps to keep you and other patients in the unit safe. Upon arrival to the uh, waiting room, uh, if you have symptoms and have not called ahead, immediately inform the staff of any fever or respiratory symptoms. Don't sit in the waiting room with other patients uh, if you're symptomatic. It's important to bring it to the attention of staff early so that the staff can quickly identify and separate you from uh, other patients at least six feet away, as Alan mentioned, to prevent uh, spread to other uh, patients waiting in the lobby and other staff. Uh, and all, as Alan mentioned, all patients are asked to wear a face mask, uh, and these are provided to you at check-in. And you'll be asked to keep those masks on during the treatment until you leave the facility. There are posters, handouts, and other education for patients about the importance of hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and cough etiquette. Uh, there are also, should also be um, boxes of tissues, alcohol-based hand sanitizer, trash cans with covers that are provided in your uh, waiting area and the treatment area. And as Alan mentioned, soap and water are very effective uh, for prevention and are available in hand washing sinks and restrooms. And you'll, you'll notice that staff have had uh, increased 
um, that all of the uh, areas of the facility should have increased frequency of cleaning and disinfection with agents that are affected against, effective against COVID-19. And these are frequently touched surfaces, such as door handles, arms of chairs, light switches, and tabletops. It's important to restrict visitors to protect patients. As Alan mentioned, asymptomatic patients, people who are accompanying either family members or a home health aides accompanying family members may actually have virus and be asymptomatic. So only essential visitors should, be, uh, should enter the facility and will be screened. Temperatures are taken, and these uh, visitors will be asked about symptoms of respiratory infection and asked to wear a mask upon entry into the facility. Uh, in the dialysis treatment area, there is routine cleaning of surfaces as per usual, but any uh, surface or supplies or equipment located within six feet of an ill patient should be disinfected or discarded. Staff have been trained about the proper use of PPE, and uh, Dr. Kleiger has already mentioned this. Patients with respiratory symptoms will be treated in a separate area or at a corner or end of row station, and this should be six feet away from the main flow of traffic. And just to be aware, this may affect your chair location, a change in your treatment time, or even change in your treatment day or where you receive dialysis. To protect other patients and staff, you may need to be temporarily transferred to another facility based on the symptoms if you are diagnosed or suspected to have COVID infection. So COVID positive patients are sent temporarily to a COVID designated unit or can be dialyzed in an isolation room in your home unit, not meaning home hemodialysis, but in their own home facility. And Pro providing that the isolation room is not being used for hepatitis B patients and that it's disinfected after use. Persons under investigation are being um, referred to as PUI patients. Those are patients who have not been tested for COVID but have a risk factor or have um, a suspicion for potentially being COVID infected. P PUI units, um, there are PUI designated units for these patients, or uh, there are designated shifts or an isolation room in your own dialysis unit that can be designated uh, for care of these patients and disinfected, disinfected after use. It's important to note that if you are COVID positive or suspected to be at risk for having COVID, special precautions are required for transport to and from your unit to protect other patients and for uh, the drivers. Once you've recovered from being COVID, you can return to your home hemodialysis facility. In New York City, the Department of Health states that you may return uh, to work or to uh, your home unit seven days following the initial onset of the illness or 72 hours after being fever-free without the need for medications such as acetaminophen, which is the generic name for Tylenol, or aspirin. And if your cough, shortness of breath, and other respiratory symptoms have resolved. COVID-19 testing may be performed at local test sites. Please ask your physician for assistance on this if you think that is, this is indicated, or call your local Department of Health. Many mildly ill patients who do not require hospitalization and are suspected to have COVID infection are not tested, but are treated as such. These are the PUI patients. No effective treatment is available at this time, as Dr. Kleiger has already mentioned. So to ensure that staff are healthy and in terms of caring for patients and protecting patients, the personnel are monitored for symptoms of respiratory infection. Staff temperatures are taken when they report to work, and any staff who have fever, cough, shortness of breath are asked to stay home and not come to work. This is our own uh, Bronx, New York experience, two sample units, uh, and what has happened over the last month of uh, March. And this is a rapidly changing scenario, and the numbers have changed. Just wanted to give you an example of what we've been dealing with. 
So in Bronx Unit A, the patient census is 145 patients. Five patients have been sent to the hospital and are COVID positive. Three are discharged and two are recovering in the hospital. After discharge, COVID, uh, these patients are sent to the COVID-designated dialysis unit and appropriate transportation is arranged. They are uh, there as per our uh, dialysis chains protocol for 14 days and sent back to their own uh, home dialysis unit with a mask. We have had in this unit five persons under investigation, and these are patients have been sent to a designated unit where they're receiving dialysis on the last shift so that it can be appropriate cleaning after completion of the last shift. In Bronx Unit B, we have 136 total patients, and one patient was sent to the hospital from her nursing home. The patient was in her dialysis facility one day prior and screened negative by the screening processes that we've been mentioning. The patient wore a mask and received dialysis that day and was otherwise fine. The following day, she was sent to the, to the hospital where she was admitted to intensive care for respiratory failure and died in the hospital approximately a week later. Staff and patients who came into direct contact with this patient were monitored for two weeks and none became COVID positive within the two week period. We've had in this unit three suspected COVID persons under investigation, one sent to the designated PUI unit for two weeks and two patients continue to receive dialysis at their own unit in the isolation room since this unit does not uh, treat any hepatitis B patients at the time and the isolation room was not being used. Uh, my own personal experience in terms of how the uh, th challenges have been such that I found that the nursing staff have a low threshold for considering a patient a person under investigation, rightly so, because as, as Dr. Kleiger mentioned, the symptoms are quite subtle and um, nothing really out of the ordinary oftentimes. Most PUI patients have been considered low risk with a mild cough, sore throat, low grade fever, diarrhea, nausea. The problem with the inability to perform rapid testing for COVID has put us at a disadvantage in New York, but uh, may improve for the rest of the country, for, hopefully. Our nursing staff have been instructed to call me, the medical director, directly. Initially, there was anxiety with the staff of the novelty of the disease treatment pathway, uh, but after several cases, um, this became much more comfortable for staff. Uh, initially, there were multiple phone calls for each case, but with time, the process becomes more streamlined and organized, and I have to give credit to our dialysis organization because they've had protocols and the administrative staff have been very helpful, supportive, and responsive, and have uh, given a lot of in-services to the staff. In terms of my observation about patient response, the majority of our patients have been understanding and know that there's a need to protect all patients and staff in the unit and that this is a very contagious virus. Uh, they've been accepting transfer to another facility temporarily for the most part. We've had two patients or family members of patients who have become upset or refused to relocate to a PUI unit temporarily because of the fact that they live quite close to our unit and transporting is a hardship for them. These patients we've tried to accommodate by allowing them to dialyze in the home facility in an isolation room for 14 days. How has COVID affected our own staff directly? Well, quite a number of uh, dialysis staff have been confirmed COVID positive. Many staff are symptomatic persons under investigation. Two physicians subsequently tested negative, both had sore throats or hoarseness. Um, many staff are asymptomatic but considered persons under investigation either because they uh, were quarantined because of contact with COVID exposure or from recent travel from areas such as Spain or South Korea. Um, in the five boroughs of New York City, 40 dialysis staff have tested COVID positive. This is as reported by one dialysis 
dialysis chains experience. And of course, these staff have small children oftentimes and um, are in the community um, prior to the time of social distancing. And hopefully this will improve. What about my observation about supplies? Well, in the early part of the COVID-19 epidemic, everyone was fearful. This, is, this was most obvious in terms of the toilet paper crisis. But it happened in the dialysis unit. Patients and staff were fearful of not having enough su supplies. And so this led to undesirable loss of masks, tissue boxes, hand sanitizers from our facility. We've addressed this by monitoring and storing supplies to prevent this excess loss. We've also had the administrative assistant, the secretary at the front, distribute the masks individually to all, everyone coming into the unit. To the credit of our dialysis chain, they had um, quite early started handing out masks for all patients, essential visitors, and non-clinical staff, and also had implemented early use of uh, full personal protective equipment for clinical staff at all times while working in the unit. Uh, we have not had any shortages of any supplies to date, and that I've been told that they don't anticipate any, that they're fully stocked. So what should we or the rest of the country expect over the next month? Well, the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic in New York City is projected for this week. And it's unclear if this, again, is just a projection, an estimate. We don't know if this is reality, but it appears that things are slowing down. And we don't know how long this is going to last. Um, the, unfortunately, the projection for the course for other parts of the United States is later in the spring. I reviewed this and I, I provide the website down below, but the projection for Texas is in uh, first week in May. In Virginia, it's later in May. And this will likely depend on this, upon the su success of self-quarantining. Uh, so I, I agree with Dr. Kleiger and reinforce that this is the most important thing that everyone can do. If you can stay home. Do so, please. Um, fortunately for the rest of the country, uh, you'll be at an advantage because more COVID-19 testing is becoming available and there is rapid testing availability. This will help with both patient and staff diagnosis, will improve relocation to the appropriate dialysis setting, will improve determination when it is the staff safe to return, return to their um, dialysis facility to work, and will improve the ability to decide when a patient may return to work, uh, re may return to their own facility after being sent to a, temporarily to a COVID or a PUI facility. I also foresee, and it's starting here in New York, the increased use of telehealth visits for physician and other ancillary staff rounding during the COVID-19 period. This is to protect patients from staff members and to protect staff members from patients. Uh, this, again, is expected to be a, just a temporary measure. Lastly, um, I, I see that for the time being, remotely reviewing patient lab results and medic medication refills uh, has been implemented and it has helped to continue care of the patients. Thank you. So before I quickly introduce Dr. Sharma, um, you saw the data coming from New York, the epicenter, the place where this is really struck. And while it's clear there are some patients who get sick and there are some staff who get sick, if you have an overall look at the numbers you just saw, most people, even in places where the epicenter is, do not contract the infection. I think that's really what's important. If you're careful and you're doing all the right things, the chances are pretty good. And so with that, let me introduce Dr. Deep Sharma. He's an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the Montefiore Medical Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Deep? Yes, thank you, Dr. Kleiger. Um, and I want to thank ASN for um, giving me the opportunity to share my experience um, in my in-center and home dialysis unit in the Bronx. Just to give um, everyone perspective, uh, my dialysis unit where I'm the medical director, uh, we have uh, 235 patients as of last month. Uh, we treat patients four shifts every day uh, for six days of the week, and we are closed on Sundays. We have uh, 36 stations for dialysis, 
uh, with one isolation station for hepatitis B positive patients. Um, and we have six um, hepatitis B positive patients that are currently getting dialysis in that isolation unit. So this was one of the challenges that we had um, early on from uh, the CDC and from ASN. Um, if a dialysis unit had an isolation um, station that was not being used for hepatitis B positive patients, then we could have used that uh, to treat our COVID positive patients. But we were limited in that fact um, because our isolation um, uh, unit was taken up already by the hepatitis B positive patients. So far, as of the weekend, uh, we had 11 confirmed positive patients. Four of the po uh, positive patients are still in the hospital, and seven have been discharged. Among those that have been discharged, three of these patients are back in our unit because they, it's already been seven days um, since they've had their symptom onset, and if they have not had any fever or did not need any medications for the last three days to control their fe fever. And three of these patients that have been discharged are getting treated at a designated COVID unit. Interestingly, in all of this, we also had six patients that had some symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, they had low-grade fever and shortness of breath, but tested negative. And I think that is important to remember as well. You know, even though the flu season is uh, coming to an end, there are still cases of the flu. The allergy season is still going around, and also a lot of dialysis patients, because of um, uh, their issues with fluid overload, um, they do have a lot of these symptoms of low-grade fever, shortness of breath, and it can mistake um, us to think that this could be COVID-19. Uh, so not all patients with symptoms have tested positive, and we've had six of these patients that have uh, tested negative for COVID-19 um, and are back with us in our dialysis unit. As far as the symptoms go, fever has been the most common symptom. Um, usually it is anywhere from low-grade fever to a fever as high as 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And the next common symptom has been shortness of breath and cough. Um, we had one patient that had fever and vomiting and then later on turned out to have uh, COVID-19. So stomach symptoms have been less. It's mainly been symptoms associated with fever and, um, and difficulty breathing or cough. So what has been our primary goal um, over the last two weeks? I mean, uh, both uh, Dr. McCricky and myself work in the hospital, and the hospitals are just too busy right now uh, treating patients with COVID-19 infection. Uh, so we've uh, been, so our main one more of the most important goals has been we've been trying to avoid sending patients to the hospital or to the emergency room unless we feel like hospitalization is really needed uh, for them. Uh, the second goal that we've been trying as much as possible is to separate the COVID positive patients and patients with suspected infections from other patients um, to prevent the spread of infection. And both of these things have been um, very challenging for us. You know, for the most part, for our dialysis patients, the hospitals are almost like our, our comfort zone. We try and treat the patients as much as possible, and if we have um, issues that cannot be handled, uh, we asked them to go to the hospital, uh, but, but we've been trying to avoid doing that, and, and um, that change in practice has been quite challenging. Um, also, to try and separate the COVID-positive patients from other patients has been challenging because of uh, the limited ability of testing, because we need to make a very quick determination um, about whether the patient is positive or negative, uh, because, you know, if a normal person has symptoms and they get tested for COVID, then they are um, asked to isolate themselves till the results are obtained. But dialysis patients don't have that luxury. They still need to get their dialysis three times a week, otherwise they can end up getting very sick. And because of the inability to test effectively and, and get the results in a timely manner, it has really limited our ability to be able to know when and where to exactly treat um, these patients for their next dialysis. So as far as the practice that we do, um, as Dr. McRicky mentioned, all patients and staff are screened every day for temperature if they have any symptoms or if they have been in any contact with positive cases. Patients have been asked to call prior to coming to the dialysis unit if they have any symptoms so that the contact can be minimized with other patients. Um, at least in uh, my experience, um, very few patients have actually called ahead of time. Most times they do come to the dialysis unit and once they are there, that is when we find out they have had symptoms or they have a fever. 
once they're in the unit and if they have the symptoms for, for illness, they're actually placed in a specially designated room to avoid contact with other patients. This was one other thing that was quite challenging in our dialysis unit is because we did not really have a room where we could keep these patients. Many of the dialysis unit, they have an adjoining home unit um, with them, and there they could have a room where they could actually keep patients or waiting uh, for instructions from the doctor about what to do. But our home unit was a floor above, and we could not, could not really get our patients to go up there. So we had to actually create one of our office spaces, one of our office rooms, as a specially designated COVID room where we could have the patient stay while we made a plan for them, um, the next plan for them. Once the patients are in the room, the nurse then calls the doctor to determine if the patient is sick enough to go to the hospital or if they can be treated um, in the same dialysis unit um, uh, as uh, per the protocols that Dr. McCraggy said in the end of the row, um, as, as much separated away from the other patients as possible. Um, all of our physicians in our practice are covering their own patients, um, even uh, during the weekends and even at night, because we know our patients the best, and it helps a lot with, uh, with trying to determine what the best course of action for the patients are. Um, in all of these, our dialysis organizations have been very supportive. Uh, they have come up with excellent protocols um, in a very timely manner uh, to help us um, in this very difficult crisis. So early on um, in, um, uh, in the outbreak, we had a COVID-designated dialysis unit, uh, but unfortunately this unit was located in another borough, so it was very inconvenient for the patients. Also because of the number of patients with infection, it got filled up very quickly. So we on our end had to really improvise to be able to make a plan to treat our own patients in our own unit. What we did was we actually decreased the time for all the patients and created an extra shift of dialysis at the end of the day. On one of these days, we treated all patients with suspected infection, and on the other day, we treated everyone with confirmed positive infection. Thankfully, this week, uh, the dialysis organization, they were able to get expedited approval to open an upcoming unit. Um, this was already in the works, but because of... Uh, because of the nature of everything, they, they, um, they sped things up and were able to get approval. Uh, so this dialysis unit is now running two shifts a day. It is actually running three days a week and not six days a week. Uh, one of the shifts is for the, the confirmed positive and one of the shifts is for uh, the people under investigation. And that has allowed us to resume a regular schedule for other patients in our own unit. The good thing about this new unit is that it also has testing ability with a 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. So we know that if a patient comes there with a suspected infection, they get the, the, the testing done, they get their dialysis on that day, and then by the time they're ready for the next dialysis, we have the results of the test, so we know whether those patients need to be treated in that COVID unit or whether they can come back to us if they test negative. Um, a couple of our dialysis staff actually also needed to get trained in doing these swabs uh, for COVID testing. Uh, so that was another thing that we had to add extra. So what has been our challenges um, in all of this, uh, this experience? Um, the first thing, as I said, is inability to get test results in a timely manner. It has made it very difficult to know when and where the patients need to be placed, when um, and where they can get their next dialysis. And, and this is how it is uh, so different from uh, people in the general population. Transportation has been a very big challenge, especially for those patients that have confirmed positive uh, because you need almost an ambulance. You need a very specialized transport van uh, with appropriate PPE, even from the driver, appropriate transport mechanisms to avoid that patient infecting other people around them. Um, and on top of that, you know, for the patient, it's, it's also very, uh, very difficult because one, uh, they already have the anxiety of having the disease and secondly, they're going um, to a dialysis center in a very unfamiliar location with, uh, with staff that they have never seen. Um, so that has been um, also a very challenging experience, mostly for our patients. We've also been challenged with a lot of staff illness. Uh, two of our nurses and four of our technicians have been out with the illness. Uh, but the appropriate use and the provision of PPEs um, has been very useful in alleviating much of the anxiety of the dialysis staff. 
And I have to say that I think the, the staff um, that we have have shown amazing dedication and bravery in all of this. Um, the other challenging thing that I mentioned was that in our dialysis unit, the space logistics, we did not have an isolation unit, we did not have an extra room uh, to be able to treat these positive patients, um, and we've had to improvise with a lot of what we did. Uh, thankfully, in all of this, uh, as Dr. McCritty said, uh, my experience also has been very positive with the patients. Um, you know, the patients have been very understanding with the whole process, um, even with our doctors having limited number of visits and them not seeing us as often as we used to be because we are in the hospital. They've been very appreciative of the staff and they've been very appreciative of all the processes that have been in place uh, to help um, treat them during this difficult time. Um, and the other thing that I found challenging is the decisions that I've made in the dialysis unit, especially about decreasing time for the patients. What worries me is that you know my decisions, my um, things cause uh, patients to be admitted for or go to the hospital for non-COVID related illness. Um, one good thing or silver lining in all of this has been that the interest in home therapy among the patients that come to the dialysis center to be treated has actually grown. So. It may be that once everything is, is done and settled, we may have more patients wanting to do therapy in home where they can stay at home and not have to come uh, to the dialysis unit three times a week uh, to get the dialysis. Last thing about my uh, experience in the home therapy unit, I also have some patients on peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. Our main goal there has been to try and minimize the visits and exposure to the patients on home therapies, both on peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. So usually when our patients come, they, uh, they, they do two visits in the month. On, the, on one visit, they get their labs drawn. And in the second visit, um, we do the monthly visit with the physician and also administer any medications that need to be done. But we've tried to minimize that to just one visit where we do both the monthly labs, um, the physician visit, and the medication administration on the same day uh, based on the lab results that we have from the previous month to try and avoid additional trips uh, for these patients. And the last thing is this is where we really use telemedicine to try and minimize exposure for patients and staff um, so that uh, we minimize uh, the risk of infection and transmission of infection as much as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deep. That was terrific. So, um, uh, Kathy, why don't you help us to get questions together and uh, we'll, we'll see how many of them we can handle in the next uh, 13 minutes. Okay, we'll do. Um, at this point, I've mainly seen positive comments about the, the presentations. Um, someone did ask about the slides and the recording, which will be made available. I have not seen a specific question um, regarding uh, COVID-19 or any of the, the things that we've talked about today. Um, please enter your questions in the chat box and we will answer them at this point. So for those, uh, have, have either of the two of you guys done telehealth directly? So yes, this is I the, have, oh, sorry, go um, go ahead, Deep. No, so I did my telehealth. I've not done them for the in-center hemo patients, but I've done them for the patients that have, uh, for peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. Um, so I've done it for them, and uh, basically when they come for that one visit um, to get their labs drawn or get their medications, um, the nurse um, or the clinic manager um, through a, a video chat um, has, uh, has connected the two of us, and from my office in the hospital, I was able to, uh, to do the visit with them uh, through that. Okay, and I can just share that um, here in New Haven, we are going to be starting telehealth visits um, starting next week, and the mechanism is set up to do it, um, visiting each patient individually. Um, unfortunately, the doctor won't have hands-on uh, ability to uh, examine, but we'll have almost everything else, all lab data available, and be able to talk and deal directly with the patients. Um, Somebody, Lisa, you just asked whether reusing masks is safe. It's a great question because so many of us now have no choice but to be using masks for a prolonged period of time or reusing them. Um, the CDC has told us that as long as masks are not visibly soiled or wet, 
that they can be safely used and reused again. At Yale New Haven Hospital, I can tell you, there's actually now a reuse program where they're collecting N95s and are reprocessing them and then redistributing them again. So there's reuse not just for one person, but for multiple people. And the studies so far uh, appear that that's absolutely safe to do. So Kathy, go ahead, ask us some other questions you've seen. Okay. Um, there was a question regarding, uh, can patients be given paper lab reports? Should they be handed the, the piece of paper? Um, and then sort of associated with that, should the um, dietitians and the social workers be doing more telecommuting or being on the unit? Michelle, do you want to talk sure. about the paper report? Sure, no, sure. Not the other. So, our dietitian is still handing out paper reports. Uh, many patients are also able to look up their lab results on their phone. Uh, but uh, as providing that the uh, dietitian is washing their hands prior to touching the paper, because the virus can be transmitted, um, that's a very good point. It would be preferable if we didn't have to give uh, paper reports, but uh, many patients are not, uh, do not have smartphones and are not able to actually, ha don't have the ability to look up the labs on the phone. The latter part of your question, our dialysis chain is still requiring the social worker and the dietitian to physically be present in the unit and are considered essential employees. If it were up to me, I'd prefer they, they too do telehealth, but I don't have control over that at this time. Yeah, I think um, for the social yeah. workers, sorry, especially with all the transportation arrangements that need to be made for um, the COVID positive units, I think their role has been even more amplified in all of this. So and the dietitians probably could do most of their things from home, but I think the social workers, um, even though they don't have to interact with patients, I think you know it's important for them to be in the unit to be able to handle most of uh, the things that, uh, that uh, are going on with the patients. Okay, Kathy, next. Kathy, you're, you're muted. While Kathy's unmuting, one other challenge we've had is that we've had many staff members who are pregnant and we haven't wanted them to be in an environment where they potentially could get infected. So. That has also been challenging in terms of having enough staffing and substitutes. That's where telehealth would also come in uh, into use and be very valuable. So also while Thank we're you. waiting, Darlene has, asked, can, can patients use homemade masks? And I would encourage anybody to be using cloth masks when they're not in the dialysis facility, when they're out and about. In the facilities, uh, the standard surgical masks are being handed out, and they probably um, are a better choice than the variable homemade cloth masks that are made when you're in a, a place like the dialysis unit. Uh, some of our nurses, I can tell you, who um, <laughs> like their homemade masks are placing their homemade masks over their standard uh, masks in the hospital. Um, and as long as those masks are cleaned, I don't think there's any problem with that. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Great. Uh, the question was, are you getting negative test results 24 hours apart before deeming a patient COVID-free? Deep, do you want to take that? Um, yes, so no, at this time we're not, just because of the limited ability to test. Um, right now our protocol is mainly with symptoms. Um, so if a patient has, it's been two weeks since the onset of illness, and if they have had um, no fever um, or a fever that they did not need to take Tylenol for more than 72 hours, then they're deemed to be COVID-free and they can come back to our, our unit. So let me tell you the CDC's recommendation. The CDC's recommendation is first, if you can obtain it, to have two um, negative tests 24 hours apart, then it is safe to go uh, back out into the community. 
If those tests are not available, the CD suggests that if patients have had at least seven days from the first symptoms and at least three days, 72 hours, from their last any evidence of symptoms, that it's safe to come out. In New York, Thank the you. testing has been very, very limited. Yeah, I can just add quickly that in New Haven at Yale, we have our own virology lab that's doing the testing ourselves. And so we've been more lucky, and we can do that testing. OK, thank you. Um, an another question that came in, is a PD patient better suitable to fight off the virus than an in-center patient? I'll take that, because we have both here as well. Um, patients with, uh, uh, with chronic kidney disease who need dialysis are equally susceptible whether they're hemo or peritoneal dialysis patients. But the great advantage of being a home peritoneal dialysis or a home hemo patient is that uh, you can do, um, uh, you know, you can be isolated at home the way the rest of the population is and not have to be exposed to other people in a dialysis facility. So in that way, home therapy, whether it's hemo or peritoneal, is a great advantage. Thank you. Uh, we had a question if staff, are, uh, if staff uses extra PPE, um, such as the hair covering and the, um, the shoe covers. So let me take that because I, I'm just putting some data together from overseas, from Europe and from Asia, in addition to the United States. Um, the recommendations um, here in this country have been to use gloves and masks and eye protection and gowns, but nothing more than that. The uh, recommendations that have come from several countries in Europe have also included hair covering and shoe coverings. Um, there are no data to actually support one or the other. There's no, you know, uh, information base that would tell us that it is safer to use those coverings. But I can just report that that's what different authorities have recommended. Thank you. Uh, another question was, are you testing the staff and dialysis patients in the center? Deep? Yeah, so um, we are testing in the COVID positive unit. I mean, the main problem is with the availability of the test. So the dialysis organization has felt that the best place where this testing would be made available would be in the in the centers that are the COVID designated centers. So in those centers, um, all the staff and the dialysis patients are being tested there. Okay, and um, I see that uh, Mark Newman has asked whether the COVID tests appear to be reliable. Uh, some reports of people being negative and subsequently test proving positive. So the testing that is used um, is a, a reverse transcriptase uh, polymerase chain reaction, big fancy words that say it's an extremely sensitive test if there are virus or virus particles around. In somebody who has um, disease who already is symptomatic, there are loads of viruses there. The only time you'll get a false negative will be if the testing wasn't done right, so the sampling wasn't done correctly, or if there's what's called heat inactivation in places where it's very hot and the samples sit out in heat or the sun, the virus can be inactivated. Those are the conditions where you get false negatives. In the United States, in April, virtually anywhere in the country, the likelihood of a false positive that way is exceedingly low. The people who have, and there have been a few, as we know, who test negative and then test positive after that um, are, are likely people where the testing technique the first time around was not as good as it needed to be. That's what's most likely. Um, on the other end, it's important because at the end of illness, when no virus is around anymore, testing will be negative, and you can be pretty sure that if it's negative, there are no viruses. 
blood tests, serological tests for the virus are just coming to market now. And that will tell us whether people who don't have virus anymore have immunity. They will be positive on the t blood tests for immunity. And that will be really helpful. Thank you. That's Kathy, maybe um, one more? Yes. Um, here's one that says, uh, can you confirm whether it is important that patients not skip their treatment but should call ahead if they are experiencing symptoms um, or think that they've been exposed to the virus? And along with that was the question, should when patients come to the facility and um, should they do the test? the facility do their testing out in the lobby or outside the building, outside the unit. So Michelle, do you want to take that? Sure. So we, of course, we always want patients to attend dialysis where it's safe. Um, it's, it's a best, best practice to call ahead so that uh, you can speak to a staff member or a physician about the uh, level of the quality of your symptoms and how severe they are so that they can uh, determine whether it's necessary for you to go um, safely to the dialysis unit to be evaluated further or whether it's indicated that you go to the hospital. Um, each, each case is different. This, unfortunately, this is a virus where the symptoms and signs are very subtle and it can be difficult to determine if somebody is positive or, positive or not. But it, if you do um, call ahead, then somebody can, uh, an RN, a physician, can screen to see the level of care that you need and if it's safe for you to proceed to the dialysis unit. But ordinarily, we encourage patients to go to their dialysis unit providing it's safe. Yeah, let me just add to that, if I may, how important it is to come for dialysis. We now have seen several patients who, because they're scared about coming and they've been told they need to stay home to protect themselves, stop coming for dialysis treatments. And there have been several examples now of people deathly ill because they missed dialysis treatments. The single most important thing to say here is that it is critically important that everyone come for all of their dialysis treatments. They, the dialysis units have all of these steps you just heard about to try to protect each other, to assess well, know when patients are sick and how to treat uh, each other well and get to the hospital when we need to. But the single most important thing to remember is we, all, we have to come in for the dialysis treatments and can't miss any because that's far more dangerous than the virus is. Thank you. That sounds like a very good note to end on today. I'd like to thank each of our speakers for um, the valuable information that you've shared. Thank you so much for being with us today, and I thank all of you who attended. Um,